Now we can move on to the flow of energy in biological systems. And in one view of life, really what life is, is the flow of energy and the drive to acquire energy, to use it to order matter. Life is ordered matter. And as we will see, thermodynamic forces in the universe drive the matter towards disorder. Yet life is very ordered matter. How does that happen? Well, life used, captures energy to maintain order. And this lion shown here is using the energy in this poor little giraffe to maintain order in, in the, the lion body. Uh, where did the giraffe get its energy from? It got it from, it's an herbivore, so it ate leaves to provide it with energy to maintain the order present in the giraffe body. Where does the grass get its energy? It gets it from the sun. So ultimately, all life on Earth is represents a flow of energy from the sun through the biological systems, through, through the biosphere. And we're going to study that now. So let's define energy, first of all. It is the capacity to do work, and there are formulas that describe that in terms of the kinetic energy of things and the mass of, of objects and the speed of objects. So kinetic energy is <clears throat> a special type of energy that has to do with motion. And the, the warmer things are, the more kinetic energy the atoms and the molecules that exist in that system have. In lower kinetic energy systems, we're talking about cooler systems. So as we will see, we can refer to energy conveniently in terms of temperature, in, ter in terms of heat. A lot of heat implies higher energy. Low, lower amounts of heat imply lower energy. And kinetic energy specifically is the energy of motion. There are other kinds of energy. Potential energy, for example. Potential energy is stored energy. And that stored energy can be released as kinetic energy or as other types of energy. Now, energy forms are interconvertible. So we can have, for example, mechanical energy, electrical energy, radioactivity is energy, light energy. And these are all interconvertible, but all can definitely be converted to heat. And so we refer to most energy in biological systems in terms of heat, in terms of temperature, because most forms of energy can be converted to heat energy. In fact, the term thermodynamics, which describes the forces that drive the behavior of matter in the universe, thermodynamics means heat changes. And there are three laws of thermodynamics. We're going to consider the first two, which are really important to us. The third one, not so much. We can measure heat energy, since that's, a, what, that's the energy we're going to be concerned with in a lot of cases. We measure that in kilocalories, which means 1,000 calories. One calorie is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree centigrade. So a kilocalorie is 1,000 calories. And to get a perspective on this, let's look at the energy flow from the sun to the earth. The earth acquires from the sun 13 times 10 to the 23rd calories per year. It's hard to imagine that a number that large. Or it's hard to imagine this. 40 million billion calories per second arrive at the Earth from the sun in the form of light and heat. And that's what keeps our biosphere going, is that energy input from the sun. So in biological systems, potential energy to do work can be stored in chemical bonds. And by breaking chemical bonds, that can release energy that can be used to do work in, bio in biological systems. Potential energy stored in chemical bonds can be converted to other forms. Mechanical energy, for example, heat energy as well. And we'll, we'll look at some of that when we get to biochemistry. And if we just look at the kilocalories per mole of, of bond energies, if you have a mole of carbon-hydrogen bonds, you have 100 kilocalories per mole in terms of the energy required to break those bonds, or alternatively, the energy released when those bonds are broken. And you can go through various functional organic molecule bo single bonds and look at these and you see that the carbon-hydrogen bonds require, have the most bond energy. And that's why carbohydrates are such great energy storage molecules as we've already considered. So carbohydrates and lipids are fantastic uh, energy storage 
molecules because of these carbon-hydrogen bonds. Um, now, when chemical bonds are broken to do work, there is always a loss of heat energy in those reactions. So some of the energy is always lost to heat. And if you look at this in terms of what we, in terms of the sun supplying the earth with energy, the bio, every biological transformation of energy causes a loss. Some of the energy is lost as heat. And that's supplied though, that, that lost heat is resupplied by energy coming in from the sun. If we look at the breaking of chemical bonds, we see that the potential energy stored in chemical bonds can be transferred from one molecule to another by way of electrons. And we've mentioned this before, oxidation is the loss of electrons, whereas reduction is a gain of electrons. And redox reactions then are coupled to each other, reduction and oxidation. And we will see this again and again as we go through some of the biochemistry of, of energy flow in, in, in biology. We've, we've covered this before, but I'll re-mention it. So here are reactants. In this case, A is transferring an electron to B, and in so doing is losing an electron, becoming more positively charged, whereas B is gaining an electron from A and becoming more negatively charged. So B is being reduced by the gain of electron. A is being oxidized by donating an electron to B. And in so doing, A becomes low, has lower energy, whereas B is higher energy because it's gained an electron. So in redox reactions, it's the reduced compound or molecule that has a higher energy than the oxidized molecule. And we will look at redox reactions shortly, but I want you to have this concept down now. So let's move on to the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that the total energy output, as that produced by a machine, is equal to the amount of heat supplied. Generally, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, so the sum of mass and energy is always conserved. So what that means is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy can be converted from one form to another in the universe, but the total amount of energy remains the same in the universe. For example, Sunlight energy is converted by photosynthesis to chemical energy, and the total amount of energy in that process is conserved even though we're transferring forms of energy. Now, some of that energy will be lost as heat, so it will not be a 100% efficient conversion. Some of this will be lost as heat, but nevertheless, the total amount, if you add up the total amount of energy before and the total amount of energy afterwards, it's the same. Can, energy cannot be created or destroyed. If you look at energy in the universe, and the universe as a whole, and this is, we'll represent that, that by a set, the salmon colored set here. And then if we look at the energy available to do work, which is really the energy that would be present in, in heat, where there's a differential in heat, there's warmer environments and cooler environments, that difference in heat allows, is, is the energy available to do work. Differences in heat energy allow uh, work to be done. And as the universe progresses, there is a, a progressive lowering of the amount of energy available to do work in the universe. The total amount of energy remains the same, but the amount of energy to do work is decreasing. And that means that um, basically temperatures are equaling out throughout the universe over time. And eventually, the energy in the universe that's available to do work will dissipate completely and there will be thermal death of the universe. Um, but that's very far in the future and it's very depressing, but we don't need to worry about that right now. What about the second law of thermodynamics? The second law states that spontaneous natural processes increase entropy overall, or in another formulation that heat can spontaneously be conducted or radiated only from a higher temperature region to a lower temperature region, but not the other way around. Yeah, she was really good. Um, heat can only be radiated from a higher temperature body to a lower temperature body, not the other way around. Remember we talked about cooler temperatures ha uh, systems having less kinetic energy in them. Warmer, hotter systems have more kinetic energy in them. And therefore, here energy flow is from higher energy to lower energy, but not the other way around. And another way to say it is that disorder increases. The warmer systems are more ordered than cooler systems. So disorder is more likely than order 
entropy is disorder in the universe, and entropy, the second law, really is that disorder or entropy increases. Entropy is always increasing. And we know this. We know that uh, disorder is the natural state of things. That's what happens when you don't put energy into a system. Things decay into disorder. So this is the spontaneous reaction moving left to right. And the non-spontaneous reaction is moving right to left. And that, in order to achieve more order, you need to input energy. And as we started this lecture with the lion, the lion was obtaining energy in order to maintain order, the order of his organismal state. Now, uh, the British scientist C.P. Snow had, a, had an amusing way of stating the first and second law. The first law is you cannot win. That is, you can't get something for nothing because matter and energy are conserved. So no perpetual motion machines. You cannot win that, that game. Energy is always conserved. First law. Second law, you cannot break even. You cannot get back to the same energy state, high energy state, because there is always an increase in disorder. Entropy always increases. So when we uh, talk about the laws of thermodynamics, we can express that tendency towards disorder as uh, talking about what happens to the free energy in the system, the energy available to do work. And we call the Gibbs free energy G it, that is the free energy of a particular reaction. Now, enthalpy is the energy that is stored in a, chem, in, a, in a molecule's chemical bonds. So we have to consider enthalpy as well. And mathematically speaking, free energy is equal to the energy contained in a, a molecule's bonds minus a factor, which is entropy, the amount of disorder, times the temperature in the system. Or... G, free energy, equals H, enthalpy, the energy in molecules bonds, minus T, temperature, times S. S is the entropy or disorder of the system. Now, in the next, next part of this lecture, we'll look at what happens to the free energy of a reaction, a biochemical reaction, let's say, um, and talk about the changes in free energy that are going to occur. And that will tell us something about the thermodynamic favorability of a particular reaction, in our cases, biochemical reactions, happening. So we're going to be concerned with the change in free energy of, of a, a reaction to tell whether or not it's going to be a spontaneous reaction or, or, or require energy instead to make the reaction happen. So spontaneous reactions, as we will see, will happen with a loss of free energy, whereas biochemical reactions that require an input of energy, you, you are ordering, you are creating more order, those have positive changes in the free energy. The energy is higher. And, and in order to accomplish that, we have to put energy in. And that's what we'll pick up with next time. So keep your eye on, keep your eye on G.